In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Today is Rejoicing Sunday, Gaudete Sunday, the third Sunday of Advent. It takes its name from our epistle, St. Paul's letter to the Philippians, Rejoice in the Lord always. It's why we use the pink candle instead of the blue or purple ones. At eight o'clock, John let me wear his uh, rose uh, stole. Some churches have rose vestments for this Sunday, and it's a time when we focus on rejoicing. So I was thinking about the things that I particularly am rejoicing about this time of year, and for me, I know you'll all be shocked to hear this, it revolves around food. <laughs> There's just something about this time of year, from Thanksgiving to Christmas, all of our family traditions, well, many of them, revolved around food. Some of the traditional food that our family put together. I'm sure you have your own uh, favorite recipes that you use every year. For me, I think back to my mom making uh, everyone's favorite cookies. And it wasn't just one, everyone had their own favorite, so she had to make a variety of cookies. Uh, special pecan uh, rolls for my uncle and my dad liked oatmeal and my brother liked something else. And I think of my great aunt making ginger snaps and my uh, mother in Virginia makes uh, apple walnut bread. And one of my real sadnesses is I don't like walnuts. I love the bread, but walnuts and I just don't get along. But you know what I mean? Everyone's got their special recipes. And those recipes can go back a long way. You may have this book in your kitchen. It's The Joy of Cooking. And it would raise your hand if you have this somewhere in your guests. Irma Rombauer goes way back. I don't know when she first published this, but it was a long time ago. This is my wife's copy, and you can see it's so well loved that it's lost all of its covers. And there's certain recipes that are marked out here as special favorites. I remember my mom having her joy of cooking, and we'd go through those recipes. But you notice something when you go back to those old cookbooks. They had different assumptions. Like, I think about when I was growing up, every recipe seemed to call for cream of mushroom soup. <laughs> now, I don't know what it was, whatever the recipe was, it could be cookies and somehow cream of mushroom soup made it in there. And many of us are moving a little bit away from cream of mushroom, although at this time of year it seems to sneak back in, doesn't it? it seems to come back into some of those recipes. Can't have green bean casserole without cream of mushroom soup. Uh, but we've changed. You look back, some of those recipes, they didn't have microwave ovens when that book first came out. Uh, they didn't know about some of the nutritional shifts that have happened. There's a whole long section, I was looking back at it, about how to set your table for various types of parties, right? It's a whole kind of worldview encapsulated in that cookbook. But recipes change. We learn how to adapt based on the changing circumstances. I had to do that. I've been trying every year to make the perfect apple pie. This is my quest. Every year I make a, an apple pie and it's always disappointing in one way or another. Sometimes the crust is too mushy. Sometimes the apples are too crunchy. Maybe you like crunchy apples, I do not. So I have moved on from Irma Rombauer. I tend to look online for recipes. So does my wife. We have allrecipes.com, which is great or the New York Times uh, cooking section, which I really like. Susan, my wife, has a, a food crush on Chef John. He's got a lot of recipes and all recipes. And I have a food crush on Melissa Clark from the New York Times. I love her recipes. So this year, she had a guide to making the perfect apple pie. She said she spent her whole pandemic making pies for Thanksgiving, trying to perfect those recipes for pumpkin and pecan and apple. And she did three things that I found revolutionary in making an apple pie. So I tried it this year, and it was my favorite apple pie that I've ever made. These three things were, one, only use one type of apple. I used to mix them to get different flavors, but if you use one type, it cooks evenly. Ah, that's one. Two, this is radical, you may not like this one, pre-cook the apples. 
so they get to the right consistency. Now that's because I don't like crunchy apples, so I tried it. I cooked the apples and the cinnamon and stuff and I got it, oh, it's just perfect. And then the third one, and this was genius, put a metal cookie sheet in your oven and preheat it so it's hot, really hot, 500 degrees, 400 degrees, whatever it was. And then you use a metal pie plate and when you put that pie plate on the metal cookie sheet that's already hot, it cooks your crust perfectly and you don't have to pre-cook the crust. I hate blind baking the crust. All right, we're going way too deep with this part. <laughs> you get the idea. These were three innovations that I had never thought of that made my pie the best ever. There are some other things I have to fix next year, but I'll, I won't talk about that now. Why do I talk about all this? It's because in our Bible study this Wednesday, um, John Higgins and Laura Cumberworth came up with the image uh, from our scriptures today of recipes. When you read St. Paul's letter to the Philippians, and when you read John the Baptist's preaching to the crowds, they said, look, this is a recipe for living. This is a recipe for how to enter into the reign of God. Each one of them gives some very good recipe advice. Paul says to the Philippians, do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. That's a pretty good recipe for living. Do not worry about anything. That's easier said than done. How do you do that? By continually offering up to God with prayer of supplication and prayer of thanksgiving letting your requests be made known to God. There's no better recipe for managing your anxiety than that practice of prayer, inviting God to take on these burdens that we carry. That's a good recipe. We don't have to adapt that recipe. I think we can just keep that one. And John the Baptist, the crowds came to him and said, John, what do we do? Remember, John was this crazy man. He was wearing a camel's hair cloak. He was eating locusts and wild honey. He was living a very radical lifestyle. And I'm sure the crowds were like, do we have to do that too? Do we have to give up everything and live out in the wilderness and the desert and eat locusts? I don't know about you, but I'm not exactly prepared. Like there's no locust recipe in the joy of cooking that I could find. So I'm not quite ready to do that. But look at the recipe that John gives the people. He does not say you have to be as crazy as I am. He says it's very simple, right? He says, whoever has two coats must share with someone who has none. We know what that looks like. We participate in outreach through Rochester Area Neighborhood House, through Bound Together, through other agencies. We are practicing as much as we're able to and we're reminded to do that. That's part of the recipe for living in God's reign is to share with those who have none. If you have extra food, share that too. We are collecting even now food in our basement to go into Christmas baskets to help those this Christmas. What about those who have uh, questionable uh, careers and lifestyles like the tax collectors? In those days, the tax collectors were given a quota. They had to raise a certain amount of tax for Rome, anything else they got, they could keep. So there was an incentive to really squeeze people to get extra money. And John says, it's simple. Just stick with your quota. Don't squeeze people. Don't extort people. Or what about soldiers who might be tempted to use their military strength and might to intimidate people and put the squeeze on them? And John says, don't do that. Do your job. It's a very clear-cut and simple recipe, kind of surprising coming from this maniac by the Jordan River, but his recipe was tried and true. So this Advent and Christmas, I think we're invited to spend a little time reflecting not only on our favorite family recipes for food, what are the cookies that you make every year or the special dishes that come onto your table, but to look at the recipes for living that you have. What are the practices in your life which are leading you closer to the kingdom of God? 
What are those tried and true joy of cooking recipes for your spiritual life that need no tweaking? And where are the areas where you might want to do some adapting? Where are the changes that you might want to make to do a better job of managing the anxiety of living in this troubled world? What are the practices of prayer or Bible study or community that you might want to adopt to do a better job of living more fully, more sincerely, more generously? Are there things that might need a little adaptation, a little Melissa Clark innovation in your apple pie recipe for your spiritual life? What might you want to let go of or to take on? Because in the end, the recipe that matters, the one that feeds us both now and for eternal life, is the recipe that feeds us with the bread of heaven, which invites us to commune together in the great feast, which begins at this table and continues into the eternal and glorious reign of God. May we together share in that life, in that journey, and in that meal when we will join with all of the saints, with John the Baptist and St. Paul and all our loved ones who have gone before, and to feast forever in the abundant life of God's reign. Amen.